Welcome back guys. Once again, I'm Caitlin Albritton. I'm a lapidary artist who uses inlay to make intricate figurative paintings in silver and stone. Now you probably already watched part one of this tutorial on how to make flush cut inlay. Um, that was all about silversmithing portion of it. Now in part two, we're going to be focusing all on lapidary work. So all the stone cutting, my favorite part. <laughs> So once again, like the last video, I'll be fast forwarding some parts um, just so we can get right down to the good stuff and you don't have to waste a ton of time on YouTube. Um, like before, I'll also have a full materials list, links of where to find everything, and I'll also have a link to my website so you can see more of my artwork if you'd like to, and that'll be in the description below. I'm pretty sure that covers the, everything I want to say right now, so let's get down to the materials. All right, now for the lapidary part of this project, you'll need a variety of a quarter inch thick slabs, a piece of paper, an ink pad, some rubber cement, super glue, epoxy 330, and then some wooden epoxy mixing sticks, some charcoal or graphite dust, an X-Acto knife, Q-tips, acetone, painter's tape, a candle warmer or something like it to remove the water from your stones, some spring clips, and then your lapidary equipment, like a trim saw or in cabin machine. Now this part is optional in case you just want to wing it with how you cut your stones, but I'm a planner at heart and I like to have a visual of what the outcome is going to be before I do it. So I'm using an ink pad to ink the top edge of the pendant and stamping it on a piece of paper that's resting on top of a folded up towel. The towel actually allows the paper to kind of hug around the edges to get a better stamping. I'll stamp this a few times so I can draw some different designs of how I want my inlay to look. I've even taken some colored pencils to those sections so you can see what color palettes would look best with each other with whatever design you're gonna go with. I'm taking a simple straight line design just to go for the easiest possible project for this tutorial. Now I've gone ahead and labeled each of the sections like top, middle, bottom, or however you want if you want a numerical order so I know where each piece goes before I cut it out. This is where you'll want to pick out the slabs you'll use for your design, and they should all be around the same kind of hardness so some stones don't cut faster than others, leaving you with some pitted sections. I've chosen petrified palm root, obsidian, and Idaho moss agate for my piece. Now I'll wipe some rubber cement on the back of the paper template and also my slabs. You'll want to make sure it's all completely dry before you try to connect the paper to the slabs. Right here I'm finishing cutting up all the different design parts out. Now here's the part that might be a little bit confusing, but whatever patterning of your stone that you want on the surface of your inlay, you actually want to place that paper template on the opposite side. The reasoning is because that stamp template that you made is actually the reverse of your design, meaning that the side the paper template is going to be on is what's going to be tucked down into your silver, silver channels and it won't be seen. This will make a little bit more sense once you see me cutting the stones in just a bit, but one way you can check to see what patterning you'll be capturing for inlay is use a pair of tweezers and align it with the edges of your template and then draw those lines on the opposite side of the template. This should give you a rough idea of what the inlay piece will look like and that's what I'm going to do with this moss agate piece. And then another thing to note is if you're going to put um, the paper template to the edge of your slab you want to make sure that edge doesn't have a weird slanted angle that'll actually mess up the piece as you're cutting it. And you can actually see me checking when I'm um, sticking the template on of that cream colored palm root slab. While optional I find it really helpful to rub on a layer of super glue on the paper templates and they tend to get a little bit soggy and wipe off and this helps them stay on for quite a long time. At the trim saw, I try to cut as close as I can to the template without getting any cut lines on the underside, which is actually going to be the top of your inlay. I do this so I don't have to spend as much time on the wheels with harder stones like these ones that I'm using. Alright, now it's time to get into the cutting and shaping. I'm going to start with the 80 diamond wheel, and here I've actually already cut down a lot of the material, and I'm slowly working towards those black lines of my template. Instead of cutting perfectly 90 degree walls, I'm actually cutting the pieces that'll be against the sterling silver walls at a slight taper inward, as you can see in the little drawing at the top corner. And this is for the, a few reasons. For one, when you bend your wire, those walls might not be perfectly 90 degree walls. And if you look inside your pendant frame and then the walls are tapered at a degree larger than 90, a taper on your stone will allow it to fit flush against the silver surface. Another reason your stone walls are tapered like this is if you accidentally overcut your stone slightly, it can actually still be salvaged by cutting some of the bottom off and kind of lowering that stone a little bit. 
Now, if your stone walls are actually 90, cut at 90 degrees and you overcut, there's really nothing you can do but start all over again with a new piece of material. So you'll see that I'll cut the stone for a while, then dry the whole stone, and then check it with a sterling silver frame by aligning one side of the stone just barely tucked into the right side of the silver, and then seeing how much it overhangs on the other side. As I get closer and closer to getting both sides just barely tucked into the silver, I'll check much more frequently with the silver framework so I don't risk overcutting it, as I slowly start working that stone lower and lower into the framework. By now my stone is very close to the bottom of the pendant framework, as you can see by looking down under the stone. One thing that might be hindering the stone from touching the bottom is my solder seam, so an easy fix before cutting any more of the walls should be to bevel those bottom edges at about a 45 degree angle, and then it'll sit flush against the bottom. Also while the stone is dry, I'm checking to see if I have any major gaps at the corners, since you want a nice tight fit. Now I'm finishing up cutting that bevel and using the wheel to actually remove the paper template so I can really see if the stone is sitting nice and tightly in the pendant. With that small bevel, this piece of moss agate is now snug as a bug in a rug. It's firmly in place on all sides with that light taper, but I've made sure that the side that will be touching the next stone, which will be obsidian, is cut at a 90 degree angle so that'll align a lot easier. Now we get to do it all again with the next slice. I've already cut off a lot of the obsidian off camera since it took a while to get to this point. But if you're using a softer stone, you'll spend a lot less time on the wheel as you get closer to fitting it at the bottom of your design. And as you're doing this, you want to make sure to dry your stone before fitting it in because the wander has a tendency to hide gaps you might have. Also, if you're holding your silver pendant close to the wheel like I am as you're test fitting, make sure not to hit it because I've done that before and it's really not fun to get out all those gouge marks. The last piece has already been cut to fit slightly for time's sake, but now I can't see how far down it's sitting in my silver with the other pieces there. What you can do is use a pencil to mark along the top edge of the silver, then hold the stone up to the outer wall with the pencil line just above the walls to get a general idea of how deep it's sitting before making any adjustments. Don't worry if this piece doesn't fit all the way down to the bottom of your kind of framework, you're mainly looking for a snug fit with most of the stone inserted. Just make sure when you're doing test fits at this stage that you aren't pushing the stones too hard together and wedging them in place that you can't remove them when you go to glue them in place later. If that happens, you might need to break out some pliers to yank them out or just start all over again if they're that stuck. All right, I'm all done cutting my pieces to get ready to glue, but now I like to do one last look over to see if there's any gaps that I might have missed and that I still have a nice snug fit. Now that I know everything's good to go, I'll remove the stones and prep them for gluing. Because there might be some residual super glue or rubber cement on the bottoms of the stones that might interfere with the epoxy, I give them a good rub down with an acetone soak Q-tip. Because they'll still have water in them if the stones just came off the wheels and now they might have some acetone on them, I'm gonna use a candle warmer to heat the stones to remove all that water that will also mess with the epoxy's bond. Leave them on for about 10 to 15 minutes. Then I'll also go ahead and clean the inside of the sterling silver pendant with acetone since I always get a bunch of rock dust in there from the test fittings. Now I'm going to go ahead and use some painter's tape to wrap the walls of my silver to keep any errant glue from making a mess of everything since it can be time consuming to remove by hand after the fact. Once it's around all the edges, I close it in the back so there's no chance of glue getting back there either. And then one of the last things I do is run the top of my nail along the top edge of the taped walls to kind of burnish the tape and close any gaps around the corners that glue might kind of be able to squeeze into. The epoxy is already going to be forming a strong chemical bond to hold everything together, but you can strengthen that by also adding a physical bond. Take your X-Acto blade to score the inside of your pendant, making little grooves that the epoxy can grab and hold onto. You'll mostly want to do the bottom, but you can kind of scrape up the sides a little bit too. Now that that's all done, and my stones have been removed from the candle warmer and allowed to cool for just a bit, I can start mixing my glue. I'm using Epoxy 330, and I already have divvied out equal parts of hardener to resin, even though it kind of doesn't already look like it. One kind of spreads a little bit more than the other. I just eyeball kind of how much I need, but try to visualize how much would thinly cover the inside of the pendant. It's usually better to have a little bit more left over than not enough and having to mix more. This epoxy dries clear, but I like adding a little bit of charcoal or graphite dust to tint it. This way, even if there is a small gap, it makes it less noticeable. Mix the glue thoroughly with a wooden craft stick so the epoxy will cure properly, usually for a few minutes. 
Now I use the same stick to smear the glue all along the bottom of the pendant, then work the glue along the sides as well so that everything has a nice layer of epoxy on it. Now I can start sticking the stones in and I'm gonna start with my bottom piece. It's fine if the glue squeezes out of the sides of the pendant since that means you put enough epoxy in there and there aren't any epoxyless sections. You can always scrape off any excess um, dribble with your stick and then reapply in areas that need it. Before you tuck in the next stone, make sure to add some more epoxy in the seam between the stones, then push the stone in. And then you'll repeat this process again with the last stone. Well, you could probably just let the epoxy cure as is. It's usually recommended to have some kind of added pressure pushing everything together by using some small spring clips. You'll have to wipe off any excess glue on the top of the stones so your clips don't get permanently stuck on there. I usually let this cure for the full 24 hours before I start to work on the next step. Once it's all cured, you can take the clips off and decide how you want to cut it. I could leave a higher dome on this for a different kind of look, but for this tutorial, I think I'm gonna trim off some of the excess stone that's sticking out from the rim of my silver with my trim or slab saw before I take it to my Cab King to make this a true flush cut inlay pendant. Trimming beforehand will also save my diamond wheels on the Cab King from working so hard and cut out a lot of work time. Now you can see that I've trimmed the stones down so I don't have as much to cut down on my 80 diamond wheel. Because the stones I chose are harder than most, I want to bring down the surface of the stone enough to where when I move to the 220 diamond, I can still get the scratches out without touching the outer silver walls with the wheel, but also enough to where I'm not having to spend excessive amounts of time on that wheel either. You really don't want to have your sterling silver walls ground down by the diamond wheels because they'll leave huge gouge marks and burrs that are really hard to get rid of. If your stones are softer, you might not want to bring the height down as much as I am here. So you have to play around with it and see what works best, but it's always better to cut slower than faster at this point. Here I dried off my stones so you can get a good look at the height of it peeking out from over the silver walls. And I'm guesstimating how much material to leave based off of my experience cutting these kind of hard stones before. You'll also see that I haven't made the surface completely flat. I've actually chosen to do a very slight dome since it's easier to deal with cleaning up those edges once we get to the resin wheels. So at the 220 diamond, my goal is to remove all the scratch marks from the 80 wheel while getting the level of the stone closer to the silver. You'll basically want to feel really uncomfortable with how close you're getting to the silver without actually touching it before moving on to the resin wheels. I've drawn it off again so you can see, or just barely see, the stone just at the cusp of my sterling silver walls. This is what I want, since these kind of stones cut dreadfully slow on my 280 resin wheels. Since we're now on the resin wheels, this one being 280, I can now safely allow them to grind at the whole surface, including the silver edges. I'm removing scratches from the previous wheel on the stones while continuing to lower that stone surface so it's flush with the silver. Do note that extra epoxy on the top of the silver wall can look a lot like the silver, and you want to get rid of that, so I keep cutting and even do a slight bevel on those top edges to make sure all that epoxy is cut away. You'll know it's all gone when the shine of the silver comes through. I've dried it off again so you can get a good look at the silver edges here, noting the shine they take when being smoothed down on the 280 wheel. Now I don't need my tape walls at this point that were protecting my silver not only from the glue but also from the diamond wheels, so I'll remove that now. Now I can go ahead and breeze through the rest of my wheels with 600, 1200, 3000, and then top it off with a final polish which will be determined by whatever stones you pick. So we're not done just yet. Off camera I did some silver pre-polish with bobbin compound before massaging it with some Zam to bring out the shine like I'm doing here. As you're doing this, just make sure to remove the buffing wheel from the pendant if you start feeling it get hot, since you don't want that excess uh, heat to build up and weaken your epoxy bond. To get the hard reach areas under the bale on the back of the pendant, I cut a strip of cotton sack that I had lying around the studio and rubbed it with some Zam to get a nice polish here. I then scrub off all the compound with a toothbrush douse and some dish soap and warm water. Right on, now you get to marvel at your very own flush cut inlay pendant. Now that you've learned such a versatile technique like this, you can keep trying out some different heights, shapes of sterling silver walls, like triangle wire for instance, or maybe even wedge some pieces of sterling silver strip wire between the different stones for an even flashier piece. You can also translate this concept over to a ring, earrings, or a cup design pretty easily. Soon I'll be posting videos on the next stage of this technique with a simple pillow inlay, where each stone is rounded out like a cabochon before fitting everything together. So make sure to subscribe to my channel if you'd like to keep learning some new skills with me. 
I hope you enjoyed this two-part tutorial, and I'd love to hear how your projects have come out or if you have any other questions in the comments below. Thanks again for watching, and see you later!